welcome to the Writing Community Chat Show. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Writing Community Chat Show. I'm so glad that you decided to join us here on Wednesday. As you can see, I'm on my lonesome again. Mr. Agar is still out. Left Chris is missing, that's right. Um, he's out of action. Concussion has come back um, to give him lots of headaches, and therefore he cannot be with us. So we, we do send our best wishes, but we're going to soldier on uh, without him because we've got a great guest for tonight and a great guest coming on Friday as well. So we cannot um, let you miss out on these brilliant guests. So, without further ado, I'm going to do the Beer Token book promotion because we have a fantastic author that has um, contributed to tonight's show. So, today's Beer Token book promotion is as followed. It's going to appear on the screen. Got to get rid of that one first, Chris. This is why I don't do production, you see. Here we go. No, it's just not repairing. Ah, oh, there it is, it's at the bottom. All along it fooled me, it was underneath. <laughs> um, the Darkest Sword by Samantha Cross uh, has 4.7 stars out of 5 after 4 ratings, and it is an LGBTQ in fantasy and horror. And a reader has said, engrossing, unputdownable novel with dark fantasy and horror themes. Mm, sounds very interesting. And... This is the rather long uh, synopsis on the back, so we're going to bear with me whilst I organise all this. So Ashen uh, was born to cause his world's apocalypse. Sorin was born to stop him. They were destined to meet as adults on the battlefield of their world's apocalypse, when fate is averted and they instead meet as children with shared fates. The future is no longer black and white. The entire world knows Ashin's name and fears it. Stolen as a child and gifted as a servant to the ruthless king of the world, he is forged into a merciless weapon. This way it gets really good. He is handsome, seductive, rich, famous and powerful. Massive combo there. Like it. No one can resist him. He leaves death and devastation in his wake. Mm. Here's the next bit. He will not be satisfied until he gains his freedom and seizes control of the entire world and he does not care who he crushes on the way. Ooh, you see. When he befriends Sorin, or befriends Sorin, he sends their world spiralling into apocalypse created by twisted fate. Destiny refuses to be denied. One of them must die. A sacrifice must be made to save their world. What happens if neither one of them is willing to make the sacrifice? Mm, leaving us on a lovely cliffhanger there. Um, so that is The Darkest Sword, which is tonight's sponsor. And let me just put that up in the corner, because normally if you watch the show, I do this little bit where I go, oh, look at that book. And that's my job. But tonight I had to read as well. So let me find it. It is here. Lovely book cover there. Uh, nice glowing man with uh, some abs and a huge sword um, on the front of that cover. So it looks really nice. Um, and yeah, as you can see there, it's called The Darkest Sword. And it is a dark fantasy horror book told from the perspective uh, or the point of view of the villain. It contains violence, gore, horror elements, sexual situations and characters of several different sexual orientations. Wow, so thank you for supporting tonight's show, Samantha, and please support the authors who support the show and uh, have a look for The Darkest Sword. It's available on Amazon and all the other good places. So without further ado, let's get tonight's guest on. Tonight, uh, today's guest, or tonight's guest, depending on where you are in the world, um, Everything Happens for a Reason is Kate's first novel. She used to be a journalist and columnist at The Guardian and The Observer, and uh, started her career at Reuters Correspondent in Berlin and London. So let's get her on um, and make sure that she we can hear her. Hi. Hello, Kate. <laughs> How are you? 
I'm fine, thank you. Nice to see thank you. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. I'm so sorry about the the awful clunky introduction, um, but the production side is not my forte, um, and I can't wait for Agate to come back. But it's an absolute pleasure to have you on the show. Oh, thanks so much for having me. No, I think I think you're brilliant. But then I'm someone who can barely operate a laptop. But um, it looks it looks good where I am, and the ones I've watched online all look super. So I just I really hope Chris feels better. That's all. Yeah, Agate, feel better soon. So, uh, Katie. We normally start the show by getting into how our authors get got into writing in general, like what inspired them to pick up a pen and start mm -hmm. writing. So can, before we obviously talk about the novel, which we're going to do shortly, can we go into your background as to why you became a writer in the first place? Yeah, I suppose it's like that old cliche that I've heard so many writers say that I did like writing stories as a child. Mm. Um, it's not what I wanted to do. I desperately wanted to be the next David Attenborough, but didn't really put my <laughs> mind to that. <laughs> like, I guess I should have studied zoology or something. Um, and then I sort of really wanted to be a journalist. So I didn't write any fiction for years, you know, apart from like loads of little stories. I had this mm. alien story I just kept writing when I was little. Um, yeah, so went to university, did languages. Um, I did the Reuters training scheme. So Reuters are a news agency. Um, mm. And they had a really good recruitment night that was kind of known for lots of food and beer. So I went to that and I was like, yeah, that sounds good. <laughs> I, I, I really slightly falls into things and I'm extremely, I've been really lucky career wise. Mm -hmm. um, so yes, yeah, so I joined Reuters um, and then from there met some people who worked at The Guardian and kind of got poached by The Guardian, which is like my dream job because I you know, read The Guardian, my family read The Guardian for years. Mm -hmm. um, and I worked there really happily uh, I think about 11 years in total, um, towards the end, writing mainly about economics, um, which can sound a bit dry, but it can be quite broad. So a lot of it was like doing nice real life features, like going out and meeting people. Um, some of it really sort of horrible during austerity, um, doing lots around Brexit, Scottish referendum, um, which was lovely when I did features. But I did a lot of things that were just sort of pumping out stuff for the website that got a lot of clicks. And I understand people really want that stuff. And I'm one of those people who clicks on news all the time. Yeah. I kind of got to the point where I was like, you know, if I were to count up like how many of my articles am I proud of, the percentage was quite shockingly low. <laughs> and <laughs> so like there's this thing at The Guardian where internally you could see you could bring up your article, see how many clicks it had got, but you could also see how much time someone had spent on the article. So it'd say something like, this article has 800 words. It takes on average three minutes to read this article. The average reader spent 10 seconds on this article. So, you know, wow. <laughs> see where I'm going with this. And I was just like, yeah. you know what? If I wrote a novel, people might read <laughs> what I write to the end. It's massively egocentric. Um, but also, um, I just always really, I don't know when it started, I really wanted to write fiction. I think I always did a bit. And then when my kids got to a certain age, I started doing this thing with their advent calendars, you know, with the 25 days. Uh, my husband's German and in Germany, you tend to have these sort of homemade advent calendars with quite big envelopes or little pouches on them that, you know, lots yeah. of people have now um, where you can put sweets and stuff. And I started putting them like mini, mini chapters for a story cut into 25 parts that I'd written, usually with them in it. Um, mm. And then as they got older, those little parts became like whole chapters. And then I got to the point where... You know, by the end of one December, I realized it was like 30,000 words long. And I was like, wow. oh, like, and that was on the side with my day job. And I was like, you know what? Like, this is just like, I think that's what I needed to show myself that I could write something from beginning to end and also yeah. do like practical stuff. Like, I know you've got kids as well. It's like the kids, the job, house, I don't know, other stuff that life's throwing at you. Uh, my mum was really yeah. ill at the time. And that like, when you really want to write, I would just sort of stay up till 3 a.m. writing these daft stories about, um, yeah, I won't go on about my children's story, but it's basically Santa's like just really hates the cold and he's moved to a hotel on the South Coast. And it's kind of like a Fawlty Towers hotel. It's called the Hopeful Hotel, but everyone locally mm. calls it the Hopeless Hotel. Yeah. So he's given himself like an alias of Bob Whitebeard and he's trying to have like a really easy life and the elves are really resentful. And I just got completely lost in this world that I would be, <laughs> you know, I'd be doing like Brexit in the daytime at The Guardian. And then I'd be like up until yeah. one or two writing about Bob Whitebeard and that, so I think that was the moment where I was just like, do you know what this mm. might be that? And the sort of my sort of slight misgivings about was I doing the, like the most, the best writing I could do in my day yeah. job. And I love that. I love the, the fact that your escapism is coming in the form of like writing children's fiction that you, that you said there in terms of with Bob Whitebeard and that whole idea yeah. of Father Christmas. How did that 
start? Like, obviously, you talked about putting it in every single day. And what what was the initial? Do you know what? I'm just going to write this one little thing down today. I don't know where he came from. I remember right drawing a picture of a silly hoax. You know, like when the kids were little, we used to do like pictures that. Mm. And I used to do this when I was a child, like pictures of a how, like if you could have any hotel. So obviously the hotel had like massive slides from the top floor to the bottom on the outside. And, you know, there were flamingos in the swimming pool and otters in the swimming pool. And like, I think it started like we were just drawing silly pictures. And I was like, oh, that could be a setting. Mm. Oh, yeah. And, it, and I was like, I determined to do them a story. And I think it was like the first chapter was supposed to be, you know, I say they were literally that long to start with. They were slips of paper when the kids were like, I don't know, six and two. And mm. then as they got older and it just sort of turned into this thing where the first chapter was a thousand words. And I was like, oh, this is like you can do a bit more. And then new characters came in, um, including this monkey that talks with flashcards, who's like my favorite. And I gave him my husband's name, Ralph. So, uh, so then I just thought it was like, and I, th I guess it helped me rediscover, you know, I loved my job most of the yeah. time, but this was like really fun. And mm. I never kid myself that I'll make a good living out of it. But we were just really lucky to be in the situation where me leaving work and not having to pay for childcare anymore didn't make that much difference um, yeah. as a family. Um, so I could do it. So I did think about, do I do The Guardian? Mm. And I, I signed up for an MA in creative writing because I just thought I can't, I, I just really want some structure if I'm going to write a novel you know, for yeah. adults. Um, right. the, and if I'm doing kids and yeah. that, I was like, I felt like something might suffer of yeah. the three. So, I was going to say, gonna say yeah. that you might have already answered this or might be answering it, but how did you make that transition then to writing something that was fun and, in, and like just almost an escapism for you to them going, do you know what, I'm going to write an adult novel and this is what this is the idea. Yeah, and it's like, <laughs> like as you're as you're not as you're not quite saying it's a, it's a novel with quite a tragic kind of theme. Uh, you know, it's mm. it's about bereavement and in particular a baby dying. I don't know. I don't know. It's like that falling mm. into things. I guess the the MA I signed up for was was literary fiction. So children's mm. fiction wouldn't have been an option, I suppose. I guess I could have done that on the side and like maybe one day I will do something with Bob Whitebeard. Mm. Um, yeah, I don't know. I think, and then when I was applying for that, it's again, it's that sort of pressure a bit like with the advent calendar of I had to hand in 5,000 words with my application to get on the MA. Yeah. And I'd had this character come to me a while ago of Rachel, who's now in the book. Yeah. Um, and at the time it was in third person. And then yeah, I sort of just sat down and imagined, I'd already imagined the first scene and then just sort of kept writing and made myself, you know, and like, what do I do now? How do I make this story go somewhere? And that's how it kind of started. So the thing I applied for the MA with ended up being my novel on the MA. Right. Um, so guess, with you, yeah. with Everything Happens for a Reason, it's obviously, it's been mentioned and publicised that it's semi-autobiographical. So mm -hmm. how did you go from that experience to then being able to write about that experience in a fictional sense? I don't know. It was, so it's quite a long, so just to go into the background a little bit. Um, so we've got, we had three children and in between my son and my daughter, I had a pregnancy that went to the full nine months and then our son Finn died just before he was born. So he was still born. Um, which obviously, like, I don't know, it's not really, I've tried to put it into words here, but it's, it's, it's really hard to put into words that kind yeah, of very yeah. sudden loss of somebody that you were expecting. It's like, and I've, I've sadly lost, you know, so far in my life, my brother, my mum and my dad. And mm. they, at the time, my mum was still alive. But I, so I'd, I'd already been through grief, you know, quite intensely by losing a brother when I was a child and losing my mm. dad when I was 18. But this was just so, it's just like shell shock, I suppose. Again, it's cliche, but it, it really was like, you know, that mm. moment when you're just told, I went to hospital thinking that something was a little bit wrong. I'd been in labor, he'd, he'd really slowed down. I wasn't sure if he was kicking and the midwife said, just go, which is what my character does. Um, mm. So that bit is very true to what happened because I didn't really want to borrow from anyone else's experience. Um, so I went to hospital and they scanned him and his heart had stopped. There's, there's no other way to put it, sorry. Yeah, um, yeah I, it's, but between that happening, that was 2010, and I think I did the MA, I started in 2017. I think, you know, I'd since had a, a pregnancy that ended in a healthy daughter, thank God, and mm. um, had really good therapy at King's Hospital where she was born and where Finn died, like just absolutely amazing um, support from the NHS. Mm. So that I suppose I 
work through some of it and then time um oh. and I, I don't know why I chose I just felt like do you know if I was going to write about anything that really means a lot to me and something I suppose that I didn't still didn't understand properly mm. and I wanted to put into words and I knew it happened to other people and I wanted to sh show what this really absurd concept is of maternity leave because you get your full maternity leave when you know when your baby dies maternity mm. leave without a baby mm. um and that sort of what what are you then you know like if you're 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 not, you know you're you're still a mum right but you you know, mm. how do you interact with society who expect you to have a baby with you all of that I just felt there was so much that maybe I needed to process I don't know what would a psychotherapist say about me I don't know <laughs> <laughs> um, so, I had to think what the therapist I saw at the time would think. She doesn't know mm. about the book. I hope. I, I don't know. I, yeah. I get scared about that. I get kind of nightmares. And <laughs> she's read it. And she's like, "Well, you still don't yeah. understand." <laughs> yeah. So you originally said that obviously you started writing everything happens for a reason from a third person perspective. Yeah. Um, why? Why did you make that switch uh, to doing it in, to, in first person instead? And why did that appeal more in the, as a writer? Um. Yeah, I suppose she was third person, and I, I don't know, maybe I felt far away from her. It was more the, the it, she had to be first person because it was really important to me that she told it as emails. And the emails just kind of came to me when I'd written a time. I hadn't written much in third person, to be honest. I've been mucking about doing other stuff, and yeah. two of the other characters were going to get their own voices in the thing, um, yeah. or the, yeah, their own points of view, their own chapters maybe even, um, and that got ditched fairly early on. Um, and I was just sort of, as part of the MA, I had a brilliant teacher called Claire Allen. Um, so that's there's two Claire Allens who are writers on Twitter. So this is the one, C-L-A-R-E, whose um, big book was Poppy Shakespeare. And she taught this module on my MA called Experiments in Style. And so she'd sort of set you things of like, write the same piece in first person and third person, but don't you dare just change it from I to, you know, he or whatever. Yeah. Like, they think about how the story then changes or what you say changes. And yeah. it was in one of those assignments. I don't know why so it came out of one of those. I just, and I, it just hit me. It's like, what would you do if you were home alone, which I was without that baby that you'd planned for and you were ready for, you know, and I remember this day when my husband had, you know, he'd got compassionate leave and paternity leave and he'd gone back to work mm. and my son who was two and a bit, had gone to nursery and that was the first day I think it must have been a Monday when I was in the house on my own when I would mm. have been with Finn and I was just like oh my god <laughs> and then it just yeah it's like there's that moment that I think a lot of bereaved people talk about you have the sort of hustle bustle of everybody visits and there's a funeral and obviously like that's the awful thing with COVID is that just hasn't been possible and I, I don't know how people are coping mm. but there was that kind of yeah and then there's that moment of oh my god what just happened to us like where mm. is this child he's not here um and I did actually get out a notepad that I bought to keep track of his feeds um I'm quite into stationery and I bought this little notepad and yeah. instead I just started writing to him and then it just like I don't know why it took me so long to work that out with Rachel this I'm um, sorry Rachel's my lady in here <laughs> um what that's what she'd do I was just like what would you do like mm. And that's and then for me that became the only way to get across that lack is somebody mm. emailing someone who and your reader knows is a bit tragic that the person who's the recipient of the emails is just an account she set up on Outlook. Yeah. Um, so she's probably can't see it on there, but I'll try and hold a page up. So they're all emails written to. Yeah, we, can, we can just about say, I think. We've got lighting. issues with knowing my left and my right here. So they're all <laughs> two LRS 17. So mm. the LRS are his initials. He's called Luke. Um, I basically spoiled my first five pages there because you don't know who the email's to until about, yeah. I can't remember, a few pages in. Mm. Um, but yeah, I suppose then it, it's just like all these ideas, isn't it? Once, you, once you've got them, they seem so obvious. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it's, it's the getting there, isn't it? To, to yeah. months. And um, yeah, so. Then I decided to write it as emails, and after that, it got easier to write. Yeah. So, how did it feel going from someone, obviously, whose job was to write um, and report um, for almost entertainment purposes, as well as it being informative? And you know, you talked about getting those clicks and getting people in, involved that mm -hmm. way. To then go in onto an MA where your work is going to be 
I say scrutinized, but I mean that in the best possible way. Um, and people viewing your work and sort of pulling it apart and giving you feedback and stuff like that. How, how was that experience for you? <laughs> yeah, that was, I, that's, I mean, it's mixed, right? Because as a journalist, more so than perhaps other people on the course, your mm. stuff is being like, you know, you don't, what I write wouldn't just go straight onto the web or straight into the paper. It would go via the news desk who'd commissioned it. And then it would go via a sub editor mm. who'd like correct the same grammatical mistakes I'd make over and over or formatting, <laughs> and, you know, or, or they'd catch that you'd, you know, misspelt someone's name on the second mention. So I was used to that and I was used to like sometimes on the news desk they'd be like this is not what we asked for write it again but to be mm. honest that didn't happen that much so you were a little bit but yeah it was it's like s slightly testing for one's pride but then I'm like mm. well, why did I sign up for an MA then like if I knew it all mm. don't don't do an MA but yeah it was quite you know and different teachers on these things have different levels of toughness mm. but I think like if I, the best thing for me about it was that I met Claire Allen and her sort of just approach to experimenting and trying to do it different ways. And, mm. and I think the, the best thing, and I did a follow-up course with her on zoom last year in the, you know, in the depth of lockdown, she did a course called get your second novel going, which was great because it's just mm. sort of, and, and that was all about like rediscovering that fun. Cause you know, when you're finishing a novel and you're like, you've done that first draft and then you've done the second and then you've like polished and edited and then you've gone through it with someone else and you've polished again, you're really like in a completely different mindset to when you're inventing people like Bob Whitebeard and Rachel and your characters, you know, yeah. you're like, you've lost that sense of fun, I think. And she made us rediscover that with some really silly exercises, like write a parody of your favorite author or, mm. you know, or parody of anybody. So I did like a, Dr. Seuss version of Cinderella, and it had to be about Cinderella. So yeah. I did a Dr. Seuss version of Cinderella and a Pen Penelope Fitzgerald version of Cinderella. <laughs> and it was Claire who really got us like experimenting like that. Yeah. And I think, and she had this brilliant thing where she's saying, you know, if you're making a film, there's a million people around you saying, well, we can't do that because we'd have to film it in that desert and that's really expensive and we can't do this. Whereas in a book, we don't yeah. have any of those limits, do we? Like, yeah. you know. Yeah, um, do which you makes want. me wonder why is my book entirely set in Clapham but <laughs> <laughs> but you know I think she was great at reminding us that, that it's it it can be really fun um yeah. and it can be silly and yeah I think the cool. hardest thing though to mm. answer your question about the transition is as a journalist you're just not used to chucking anything away yeah. and you're not used to having the time to rewrite you just kind of have to get it done and out and then you also move on to something different so being yeah. with the same person for like, you know, two years and now I'm with a new person mm. day in, day out and not getting many words down per day is, is quite hard to keep going and believe yeah. in yourself. And you says they're excellent point books are limited to the imagination's boundaries. Um, so, yeah. Um, I suppose my next question is what does your like typical day look like and how has that changed from when you first started writing so obviously you talked about how hectic you, your life is as well you know with kids and uh, your husband and you know fitting all that family time in yeah. but then actually physically getting down to write what does what's your writing day look like to you what's a good day so I think I have a like um to be totally honest a really luxurious position now because both my kids are at school um mm. So I drop the big one and it's a half hour walk and I take the dog with me, my dog Miko, um, and I walk her on the way back. Um, and then I sit down and so technically <laughs> between 9.30 and 3 p.m. Mm. I could write and, you know, and then get all the boring crap done, like, you know, bills and <laughs> cats. The cat needed reinsuring yesterday, <laughs> stuff like that, which then can eat into the whole day. So mm. I technically have about five hours in which I could write and then I could write again in the evening. Um, and then I'm trying to do bits to promote Rachel. Uh, I call her, I call this book Rachel because that's the character. <laughs> um, so I do, I try to like work out how much time you put into that and I'm totally new at this um, yeah. and how, you know. Um, but yeah, so that's, that's my day. And then I pick Ella up and I try and just be there for them. And then maybe... I do a bit more. So what I realized though with me is that having an hour count is really silly because I'm just really naughty. I'll just say I've done it, but then I'll like <laughs> pretend I'm doing research all day yeah. and I won't actually get any words down and whole weeks can go by without any words. So now I, instead of having an hours thing, I have a word thing and I have to do It's quite, it's very, very modest. It's 600 words a day. Yeah. So, so if I don't hit those 600, then I will go and sit down again in the evening. 
Um, so what do you do on the days where those 600 words are just not coming? Like, how do you get out of I that? I just make sort of... myself. So I oh, put, right. <laughs> I'm such a child, I put chocolate out of my reach. And yeah. then when I've reached 100, I'm allowed chocolate. And then the next 100, <laughs> chocolate. It's, it's like the only way. That and I switch to Instagram. So I don't have Twitter on my laptop. Yeah. And I put my phone downstairs and I switch the internet off on my laptop. Um, it's all really childish stuff. It's so silly, and I, I'm sure there. Are, I really hope there are other writers like this who have to do really childish <laughs> games with themselves to get to 600 words. Yeah. Um, yeah. I found I found lockdown hard and like homeschooling because then I really mm. just I partly didn't have time, partly didn't have the headspace, and then mm. also it's just really easy to make excuses, isn't it? Then. Yeah. Halo um, Scott says she loves the chocolate motivation. <laughs> I think you've just <laughs> given a lot of people a good tip there for getting over writer's block just to incentivize yourself with chocolate. We're quite Definitely. simple creatures, really, aren't we? Yeah. <laughs> Love it. Um, so you you have mentioned, I've seen this in your videos, uh, and the video that you did for us, you mentioned about not writing another novel, not because you didn't want to, but whether you would ever do it. So oh, how have you found it really difficult then? So you've done your first one, and obviously you I'm a, as you're human, that you are now trying Working to write a second. It. Yeah, yeah six hundred a day. How are you? How are you found it? For, how are you found in? How are you finding that then? Yeah, I, I think when I finished the first one, then I had to do the whole kind of like looking for an agent and a publisher thing, and I found that really distracting. That much yeah. more so than the than the MA feedback was like the kind of you know waiting, just that waiting when your book's yeah. out there. And like you know, checking email has your email, has your agent email back or so on. Mm. Found that really distracting. And I thought I sort of took consciously took a break while I started to think about my next character. Mm. Um, I thought it was really discouraging when you had um, Brian Freeman on last week when he was yeah. saying you know twenty four novels in and each one it's really hard to start. <laughs> I was like, Damn it! <laughs> yeah. So I kind of expected this with a second novel because I think also with this like I. Mm. Like I said, I like that it was quite deep within me that I guess yeah. I always maybe secretly knew, even if it wasn't obvious to me straight away, that that's mm. what I was always going to write about. Yeah. Um, and I've done that now. So now what do I do? Like it, it doesn't lend itself to a sequel. Well, there hasn't been an offer for a sequel or anything. Mm. Um, so there was that. But um, what I can say is the new one also has death in it. <laughs> My daughter mm. says I should just write a third one and call them the Death Trilogy. <laughs> and she's given it the working title of Death is Coming Soon. So right. I don't want to do too much about it because I guess it could change loads, but it's a male yeah. character and it's third person, which is a nice change. I don't know if that's mm. conscious. I get I tried first person for him and then ditched mm. it um, and tried different ways. But it's um, so it's not emails, thank God. Um, and he <laughs> is convinced he knows when he's going to die, like he knows the week in um, mm. many years from now. Um, and it's kind of like trying to explore what that what would that do to a person mm. if they knew when they were going to die. Yeah. So um, is, obviously with that that similar theme there in terms of fate and obviously the title for your first book, Everything Happens for a Reason, um, I was reading that that was actually said to you at, the, at yeah. the time, obviously, which is, you know, the fact that you've used it as a title and used it as a oh, sort own. of... Yeah, exactly. Um, <laughs> is that? Do you think that's something that, for you, is really interesting in terms of the idea of, obviously, if you're exploring it in book two, you're exploring that that fate and people's perceptions of things. Is that something that really interests you as a writer and what you enjoy like looking into? I don't know as a writer, just as a person. I find like, and as a as a reader. Like mm. when I see the kind of things I read, um, so things like Ann Tyler, tend to be a lot of Americans, or um, A.M. Holmes is my favourite author, also American. Yeah. Um, they're, they're sort of like, there's no real massive dramatic events, are there, in a lot of the, you know, in the mm. Ann Tyler's books, but it's someone sort of trying to work out what their place is in the world and what anybody's place is, what our purpose is. Um, yeah. So I suppose it's that kind of like, what, what am I doing here? Which I suppose mm. I asked myself, and there's a bit where my character has this thing instead of YOLO, she, you, know, you only live once, she has this thing TYD, then you die. It's like <laughs> well, she kind of goes through this phase, obviously, there's ups and downs of yeah. like any story, and she's grieving, so there's many ups and downs where mm. she's like, you know, on a bad day, she's like TYD, like then you die. What's the point of any of it? I suppose yeah. I, I'm not like that, <laughs> but I do, I suppose I do ask that question, and yeah, I, I, 
don't know why I've gone with death again. I guess it's yeah. the one constant, isn't it? Um, yeah, I mean, obviously for myself, I, I have written about death as well. And it's yeah. something that does resonate with everyone. I think everyone at some point in their lives think, well, what's next? Um, mm. So do you have any sort of ideas or beliefs that you think, do you know what, I'd really like this to be the case if, you know, it, you oh, know, wow. if I could choose anything sort of thing? I'd love for us all to be able to see each other again. I think about right. the logistics. Do you ever think about the logistics of that? I, I've, I've read about your book, but I haven't read it, to be totally honest. Um, yeah, but, yeah. yeah, it sounds, sounds brilliant. So I don't know if you looked into that, but the logistics of like how many people are up there by this point. Um, yeah, be able to find them. Like, would I be able to find my mum and dad like, and my baby yeah. and my brother? Like, I yeah, I I, I I really silly. I have this idea that so my brother died when he was eighteen and I was twelve, mm. and it does kind of go through my head. Like, is he looking after my baby? Is that the baby he knows yeah. to have on earth? Um, yeah. So I suppose, but I I don't know. I don't know what happens next. I was raised Christian. Um, yeah. I guess I have this enduring belief. Mm. in in god but i don't go to church um yeah no, i love that mm -hmm. whole thing in terms of like i've read so many different theories of people that you know some people have died momentarily and you know been brought back to life you know through medical purposes and stuff like mm. that and their experiences and i love reading stuff like that and even just people's ideas and theories about it i've looked into it loads <laughs> uh, become a, almost a sort of like it's the equivalent of a cat video for me on youtube looking at all oh, these wow. different theories and, and philosophies and stuff behind it um and yeah i mean i don't think there's any one particular thing that i prefer over anything else but it definitely does fascinate me and um, i think with some people if you mention death and you talk about it, like my partner for example if i mention it to her she just shuts it off she cannot compute it in her mind she the what the fact that one day she will no longer exist mm. if that thought terrifies her and you can't talk to her openly about it whereas other people will will actively talk about it and you know explore those feelings and emotions so it definitely is one of those things that i think resonates with everyone and yeah. does interest everyone in some way um, like i say it's so, the one constant isn't it well that's what they say death and taxes yeah. so yeah it's the one reminder that we are all equal um yeah everyone goes out the same um definitely so we have some staple questions on the show um that we're going to get okay. into now um the first one is if you could change the ending to any novel that you've read which novel would it be and why so i have to be really careful right because i don't want to spoil it so i heard you ask this question in another <laughs> in another show i was like i'm gonna start it because i'm a yeah. really slow reader i i'm not saying yeah. i don't read i'm not outing myself as a non-reader so i'm a really slow reader so i read nothing compared to the rest of my family mm. and then i'm really bad at remembering things so i read things twice <laughs> um okay but i would this is really bad to say, but I would change the ending to Atonement because I just felt right. a bit cheated. But I don't mm. want to say anything more, obviously, for anyone who hasn't read it. Yeah. I, I thought it was very, very clever. Yeah. But I just wished it wasn't true. <laughs> <laughs> so, have you read it? Do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, I know what you're referring yeah. to. Yeah. So there I had you a go. Similar, similar sort of experience. Um, I read a David Nichols book recently and the way it ended for me, I was just like, what? I almost threw the book across the room because I was like, oh, that no. cannot be the ending. Please do not oh, let that God. be the ending. Um, but yeah, I love it when that happens. Um, Anya said, um, I totally get that. And here as well, she hated Brownie in the end. Yeah. <laughs> but I quite, it's very clever though. I mean, for him to mm. raise those emotions in us about Brownie. Um, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, he's, he's, like, he's done something right, hasn't he? So when people start arguing about your characters... Yeah, and, and talking about it, that's the best advertisement that there is, isn't it? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, but yeah, I think I would change the ending just for my sake, just so I could just be mm. happy that they're okay. Anyway, I'll stop talking before I spoil it. <laughs> um, <laughs> so the second I mean. question... Yeah, the second question is... Um, in fact, Jodie just said... Uh, Jodie Cook says, I felt the same about the ending of Behind Her Eyes recently. Um, which was Sarah Pember, obviously, that we had on the show. Um, and she's obviously read that as a result. People love and hate that ending. Um, you know, I've spoke to different people about it. And, yeah, like you say, it gets a reaction and people speak 
which is fantastic. Um, so the second question is, if you could take a character that isn't your own and you could use them in any way that you like, in fiction, obviously, um, which character would that be and why? Oh, that's a good question. Hmm. Oh, I think, that, so here we go. I, I want Moomin. It's getting a bit silly now. I'm starting to, people keep, so you know, when you mention something and then everyone. Yeah, you mention it once and then you just in and they your presence. Yeah. We run out of things to buy you. So uh, <laughs> this is Moomin, we're Moomin Troll. Oh my God. Um, um, Mo sorry, Moomin Troll and Snort Maiden. I think I'd have to take Moomin Troll because I love him, or possibly his father, Moomin Papa, because Moomin Papa's really yeah. pompous. He's one of my favorite characters. Um, and what would you like to do? Book with on him? my desk at the moment. So he. So I'm wondering about whether my book, my new one, will have bits of autobiography in it because my character is also slightly pompous sometimes. And I think I'm not saying all people who write autobiographies are pompous, but you have to have a certain <laughs> ego, right? So uh, I, I keep reading um, the exploits of Moomin Popper, which is just hilarious because he writes it with what he calls his memoir pen. Um, <laughs> so he's like. Moomin Papa put down his memoir pen and <laughs> looked out the window <laughs> longingly. So I think, oh, oh God, I think if I could nick him, obviously I can't and I wouldn't dare. Mm. But yeah, I'd love what, him. What would you do? What would, you, what, would you, what would your ideas be around that? What oh, I'd put him in the Hopeful Hotel in some way. But then he'd oh, have amazing. to take over, wouldn't he? Maybe he'd sort everybody out. Um, yeah. Yeah. Sorry, that's a really childish maybe. answer. <laughs> yeah. hotel. An inspector, maybe. Oh, yeah, I love that. He'd be a brilliant hotel inspector. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I think that, um, that would be it. I'm just looking at the books on my desk for inspiration quickly, but no, I'm sticking with my answer. Brilliant. Um the last question is again, it we are realming into looking at death again. Um, mm -hmm. but you're on your deathbed and you're looking back at your writing career. What oh, what success to you? What would you be happy with? <sighs> I just, so I saw something recently where someone was giving advice to debut authors mm. and it was, you know, not everyone's going to love your book, but someone will love your book and that's enough. Mm. And I suppose like if some people spend time with Rachel in my book and they enjoy that time and maybe mm. it helps them to, if they've been grieving, you know, or, you know, or in particular suffered baby loss in any way, or they're helping someone who's grieving, maybe. I mean, it's not a self-help book, you know. I'm not. Yeah, yeah. I'm not deluded. It's fiction, but maybe I suppose it's just like the way books help you go into someone else's world for a few days, or yeah. depending on how slowly you read, a few weeks or hours. And if someone could just feel lost in Rachel's world, yeah. And if I've pulled it off, I guess if I've pulled off that trick of making her feel like she really is real. You know, when, you know, is it Anya who just said, I hated Bryony by the end? You can only hate yeah. Bryony because you believe she's real, right? Yeah. You wouldn't feel so strongly about her if she wasn't well, well written, I think. I mean, yeah, I'm not, I don't want to speak for you, Anya, sorry. But so if, if people, I hope Rachel's not my only book, but I guess <laughs> if people felt lost in my books and felt that they believed that world for a few days, that's all, really. Yeah, I love that. That's a beautiful answer. Um, so we're going to move on to the second part of the show. But before we mm -hmm. do that, we have a segment, which is a new family member. So what we do is we give a little boost to someone who has either followed the show with a bit of a low mm -hmm. following. Um, so we have a little video for that, which I'm going to find as we speak um, and play that. Uh, I do warn you, it is a bit rocky. Um, mm -hmm. So... So, um, in typical producer fashion, I have not found a guest for the new new family member. So I'm literally going to pick the last person who followed the show. Um, so, hmm. right. So that is this person, uh, which is the last person to follow the show, and her tag or her at is at l underscore m o n. T E S two two three, and she's a writer. Um, so that's L M Montes, and she's a writer of urban fantasy. She's a lover of coffee and popcorn, aren't we all? Uh, she's a Navy veteran and a creator of uh, be beaded jewelry, and she is also the author of The Trinkets of Time. So, 
Your job, Katie, is to decide what GIF we send to her. Oh, God. Um, so we're going to send a... You know what a GIF is, don't you? Yeah, yeah. Or a GIF, I, yeah, yeah. I'm just trying to remember which ones are there. So normally, it's, a, it's entirely up to you. You can send it absolutely anything. So it could be your favourite one. It could be random, like we've had cats. Um, <laughs> pretty sure we've had, like, random birds, penguins, stuff like that. We've had loads of different things. So whatever you want us to send, we will send. Oh, wow. So I have to think of a GIF. So what I normally do is I just kind of browse or I put in a word when I'm on Twitter. <laughs> yeah. Like, um, yeah. What would be relevant? So it's not. It's a shame it's not May the 4th, otherwise we could have done a nice May the 4th oh, be with you. That is true. We could have done that. It's Cinco um, de Mayo. I sent my son a dancing cactus earlier, but I'm not sure if that's culturally insensitive. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that's not too um, much. I've, that's something I've never considered whether we're being culturally insensitive or not. So she doesn't um, mention cats or dogs, does she? She doesn't. She likes coffee and popcorn. Maybe there's some sort of... Oh, coffee gift. Coffee with. gift, please. Coffee gift, right. There's got to be millions of those, right? Yeah, they, I should imagine that's, there will that's be. That's a massive part of my routine. I didn't mention the four cups of coffee after I've dropped after I've dropped the little one. Yeah. So if you're watching right now um, or you're watching this back on YouTube, please send a coffee gift um, to this person who I just said. And I'm going to send the one with Snow White um, guzzling on the coffee because um, it was up there. Uh, <laughs> that's how I feel most day, most days. Um, so it's at L underscore M O N. T E S two two three, um, and just put hashtag new family member and WCCS uh, in there if you want to. If you want to leave it completely random, which I have done in the past, then don't put any of the hashtags in there. Make it really weird for that person. Oh, um, but yeah, <laughs> stand there now. Um, okay, so the next part of the show, we move on to the writing community. So this is your chance and time to send any questions in that you've got for Katie. I know we've had a couple already pop up. Um, but again, we've got a little video for that. So let's go with this. So there was definitely a question from life earlier on. So here's the first one. Is there any reason why you chose not to reveal who the emails were to until a few pages into the story? Okay, so the um, the totally honest answer to this would be because I initially wrote that scene when I was applying for an MA and I just wanted to impress <laughs> the, people, the people running the MA. I suppose, no, I, I knew that I wanted some sort of suspense and people who've read it, um, those few pages at least, they sort of say when when you discover who the emails are to, it's kind of like, whoa, it's like a oh. I think it's punch to the guts is what some people say. Um, so I suppose I wanted that, um, yeah. That, that it then I suppose it was like I, I was quite pleased with the oh it's awful to be pleased with yourself isn't it but I was quite pleased with the idea when I finally hit on it of writing to the baby mm. so I thought I don't want to waste it you know I want to build up to it a little bit um, mm. and I just wanted the reader to do a little bit of the work because you know you come in there are emails that exist that aren't in the book that I kind of just wrote for me where she's like setting up the email account and it's really dull right because she's just like oh should I write to you should I not write to you and it's like it's not a great opening to a book um so there's all of that and I thought you know I'm gonna build up and yeah. then you're gonna and then you're gonna work it out but I really wanted it to feel like you're not being given an introduction you're just yeah. snooping on someone's emails yeah just going straight into it bro Love that. Um, next question. You spoke about getting lost in a fictional world. This is from Jody Cook. Oh, Thank you. Uh, which book do you find yourself happy to get lost in again and again? So I'm such a props person. I'm grabbing the book because she's always on my desk. Well, it's a he, the character. Um, this book. So she's my absolute idol, A.M. Holmes. Okay, oh. so... Before we talk about the book, I'm going to talk about this coffee stain, right? So, <laughs> I don't disrespect my favorite book. I had this on Kindle for years. I'm quite a big Kindle reader because I quite like to read on my phone, which is probably like yes, I'm totally with you on that. Lots of people, but I just it's just it's easier. Like yeah, when you're it, reading, it's it's awesome. <laughs> that's when it started. Like reading children, yeah, it, like, you've always got it with you. Um, so I had it on Kindle and I'd like read it and highlighted the hell out of it. But then I really wanted to have it on my desk. So my compromise was to buy it secondhand. Look, it was two pounds. Um, 
yeah, so may we be forgiven. And it's it's sort of somebody like like a lot of books, something goes massively wrong at the beginning um, for this guy called Harry Silver, who's kind of like ended up in his brother George's life, and they've had a really tense relationship up till then anyway. And it's kind of like Harry's sort of slightly undoing and then rebuilding of himself, and mm. he's sort of fish out of water kind of story. Um, but yeah, I just absolutely, I love her. And it's just like the dialogue is so direct and quite unexpected. Yeah. And I don't know whether you can get away with that more in America because for me, it just feels more believable that the scenes that sort of happen in a pharmacy where people are rude to each other, just, I don't know if I can imagine those happening where I live in leafy South London, <laughs> but I can imagine them happening here in this book. Um, yeah, I, I really love her books. And I, I, I met her at an event when I just was about to quit my job or I just quit my job to do this mm. MA and sort of told her. Um, and she, she didn't say much, but she said, promise me you'll finish your book. So wow. I've emailed yeah, her since I haven't heard back. I can't, like, I've emailed her via her website. And I'm like, you prom you made me promise I'd finish my book. I finished it. Can I send you a proof? But yeah, I mean, if here. people are watching and they want to get if in touch with her on your behalf, yeah, if she's watching, she's listening. Like, she's like, block, block. <laughs> but we're again. Yeah, then, it, you know, it's done. You kept your promise. So you held up your end of the bargain. Yeah. Um, I don't yeah. know if she offered to say anything or do anything just afterwards, be, but I think she should. Just love me back, that's all. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Um, and Jodie, again, has said... Um, it sounds like the book that I need to read. Oh, um, I, I love it. Um, I don't know if you've read any others by her, but this one is the one where it's kind of it's set over a year and you do get lost mm. in that world. And it's just, it's funny as well. Yeah. And Would you ever be tempted to to write in, in an American setting, you know, somewhere oh, maybe that you've not I mean, been to or something like that? Oh, a friend of mine did that. And I don't know how she did it. I wonder if she, and it's mm. also, she wrote it in like 1950s and 60s America and, and mm. based on all the reviews, she really pulled it off and God knows how much, but she's really organized. It's a friend I was at university with mm. um, and her book's called The Outside Lands and she's called Hannah Cola. And it, it just, I, God knows how many hours she spent in libraries. You know, she's sort of in her acknowledgement, she cites all these like, books that she read. I'm like, I yeah. think I'm, I'm a bit as yeah, you know, having been a journalist and done lots of research, I've kind of gone to the other extreme yeah. and I'm quite lazy and I just make stuff up. <laughs> so no, the best way. no to answer your question. Um, so we have some more questions coming in. So Halo Scott says, What were the most helpful things you learned from your MA? Um, I think that experimenting, I think I think I don't know. I mean I've only done one MA, but I think the important thing for me was the people who were teaching it and for me mm. it was that one teacher, Claire um I suppose it helped me learn to keep to deadlines which you sort of have as a journalist but not with such big chunks yeah and there's really like nitty-gritty stuff like don't if you're you know don't put in loads of feeling verbs like he felt or you know he thought hmm. although I noticed Aunt Tyler does that but I don't mind um you've noticed more things don't you after you've done a <laughs> yeah, right you've done like, what not to do and you notice your favorite yeah. author and like, well they're allowed to do it so I think it's that it's that kind of like pairing back and that editing where you it's really nitty gritty like you go through and you edit out the word just and you mm. edit out the word very and words that I repeat too much and you try not to put in too many adverbs but I did feel some of the MA was a little bit too much like that and then you lose mm. that experimenting don't you if you're if you have so many rules then you become confined and mm. nervous and I don't think you write as well um yeah. But yeah, I think there was some really good nitty gritty, like how to write fiction and how to like, you know, if you're in this point of view, what, what to avoid. And I think Claire just reminded me to make use of all the senses, like, you know, mm. after my first chunk that I gave to her, she's like, you, like, you know how everybody looks, but you're forgetting to tell us. And obviously in emails, that's not something someone naturally relates. So I had to find ways for my characters to sort of just give the reader a sense of what someone looked like without yeah. it being obvious that I was yeah. doing it for the reader. Mm, very so, difficult. Yeah. Does that answer the question? Sorry, I'm rambling. I think it does. Um, Halo's got another question <laughs> through two in there. And what type of chocolate do you bribe yourself with? Um, okay, gem generally milk. Um, mm. There's these Ritter Sport things, um, the square ones. There's one with like salted almonds. Like that's for that's for a really good day. Oh. Yeah, that sounds um, amazing. Generally milk chocolate. So when I was doing the MA, I was eating those McVitie's gold bars. Does anyone know what they are? It's like the yeah. chocolate. It's possibly yeah. not even chocolate. And then I realized they got palm oil in, which I felt awful about. So I had to mm. give those up. Um, it's so bad yeah. that I didn't check sooner. 
Um, but they should really be in my acknowledgements because I ate a lot of gold bars. <laughs> um, yeah, they're weird though because the 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 co coating on them is not. It's like a yellowy colour, isn't it? Yeah. So it's oh. not like white chocolate or milk chocolate. My granny used to have them, nice. you know, like she had a tin, and when you went to visit her, that's the only place I ever had gold bars. So I think they're kind of special mm. like that. Um, yeah. So, yeah, gold bars, chocolate, that's basically nice. anything I can get my hands on. <laughs> love it. Um, so we've got another question. Um, I love that you opened uh, with email correspondence in your novel. Um, any tips for people who want to... Um, Oh, sorry, that moved. Experiment yeah. with structure and layout in their novels. Um, so what I, I basically cheated by looking, so for emails particularly, I, I looked at other writers who'd done that, so this kind of mm. epistle rewriting letters or diaries. So mm. I've got a few. I've got them on my desk because I just wrote a thing for my publisher about. So this is written as emails. Um, but, yes, yeah, your question generally about how to experiment, I think just look, for me, it was looking at how other people had done it. And there's this brilliant, oh, also have it here. This actually, I think this is brilliant, this book. Are these showing up? Okay. Yeah, yeah, perfect. David yeah. Lodge is also, oh, I, I have to go the opposite. <laughs> it's like mirror image. Mm -hmm. um, so David Lodge is also a novelist who I admit I hadn't heard of um, mm. until I came across his book. And these are columns he wrote for, I think, The Independent about writing. Mm. And each one is about different elements of a book so there's a whole section about endings and he starts mm. each chapter with examples from other books so the first chapter oh, yeah. is the beginning it's one called and then there was an epistolary novel which is where i got the idea for reading a brilliant book by michael frain that's written as letters mm. or the sense of place how to do surprise um the comic novel magical realism so I found that really helpful because I'm just, I, I, I read, but I'm not like, I didn't do English literature and I'm not a massive reader and I'm not like a part, I know some people who go into writing or like worked in publishing. I'm, I'm not part of that world at all. Like, you know, I mainly read news before. Um, so I found that really good just to see how someone else has done it. And I find whenever I get stuck, I do that. I pick up. So at the moment I try and pick up a book that's in third person. So if I get mm. stuck with my current character. I just think like, I can't, yeah, I'm not, I'm not saying I plagiarise, but it's <laughs> kind of like, I'm totally stuck. Let's just remind ourselves, someone else has done it before, it can be done. And like, maybe yeah. like, I'm stuck, I'm, I'm, I don't like arguments in real life and I, I'm really rubbish at writing them. So I have to sort of read someone else's argument scene and think, okay, okay, what is it that works in this for me? So yeah. I suppose just um, not necessarily even reading whole books, but doing yeah, that. And then, of how people have done it. Yeah, so on that cool. note, we we normally do when we do the new family member, we normally do a little section where we say, "Is there any authors that you would recommend that people you know watching would pick up um, any of their work?" And you've kind of done that a little bit already, but is there anyone yeah. else that you would recommend that you think do you know what people's lives would be a little bit better if they read this book? Oh, okay. Um, so I'm looking across to my i um, I'm looking across my piles of piles of books at the moment. Yeah, A.M. Holmes would be my top, would be yeah. my top pick. And Anne Tyler. God, I'm really samey, though. There's all these female American authors. <laughs> uh, I don't know if anyone's read this. This is also, if you like getting lost in worlds, I've just read this, um, which isn't out right. as paperback yet. Mary Lawson, A Town Called Solace. Um, right. It's set in 1972, so there are no mobile phones or computers, really. And I love that. Right. Like It's just in a northern Canadian town, and I quite like that for... Mm. escapism and again it's this really gentle like there's no massive events but there is there's more action in that perhaps than other books that i like there's no massive events but you sort of feel really drawn in in this case to three characters lives and you just mm. feel like you've lived with them for a bit and i like yeah. that um definitely yeah. and then um, I, I recommend so we've got my publisher arenda the other debut out this year if anyone this is a brilliant oh book. yeah the sauce yeah that's brilliant. been really good for me to like join a publisher that does both a bit of literary fiction and lots of crime mm. to make me just expand my horizons a bit. And I, abs I absolutely love that because I think yeah. I felt really, again, drawn into the character's world. Plus there was the sort of page turner element yeah. and it's set in newsrooms, which is quite fun. So, so with the render then, obviously, and, and joining that team, because it from the outside looking in, it is very much a team. Um, I've been sent multiple books by Arenda and Karen at Arenda, obviously she's brilliant. Mm. Um, and a lot of the bookmarks say team arenda and yeah. from what I've heard from the outside is that they, you know, when they do get together, obviously COVID is yeah. stopping at the moment, but they're very much a, a, a family in that sense. 
Um, so was that part of the appeal for joining Arenda? And, um... It was. And I, I remember having a meeting with Karen early on and she was sort of talking about that. And that this was pre-COVID. I think it was like towards the end of 2019. So it was a bit before everything like happened. Oh. Um, and she was sort of saying, you know, they do a road show and they all stay together. And it's all very equal. You know, everybody mm. sort of promoted the same amount, but people help each other. And in reality, what that's meant is like people who are also so there's Eve Smith who wrote The Waiting Rooms, um, which mm. was a debut last year with a render, which is like massively timely. It's not about a pandemic, but it's about an antibiotic resistance crisis. So it's sort of a slightly dystopian future um, yeah. where everyone wears masks and carries alcohol gel. Um, <laughs> and she just got in touch on her own and just you know messaged me and said, hey, how, how are you doing? So you've joined. How, how's it? How are you feeling? Like, how are you coping with like talking to people about the book or, you know, everything she just like yeah. out of the blue just contacted me and louise beach who's also um with a render you know on um written many many books um and yeah. we've got our books out together in the summer um hers is this is how we are human she's also been really lovely to me just again just messaging and read my book really quickly which is like you know when you've got a book out and you're like is anyone going to read it at all and you're like <laughs> someone like that reads it and it's just lovely yeah. so yeah, yeah right. it's a really nice feel and karen's just amazing and i think mm. For me, it just felt really like I think her books are quite—I shouldn't say experimental, but they're just a bit like there's a bit more leeway to, you know, yeah. written as emails I mean, to a baby, for example. Yeah, I mean, from a reader's perspective, I just think a render setting. I mean, this is my just personal opinion. I think they're setting a benchmark in terms of what fiction should be about, and it is a lot more relatable. Um, it does take more risks. Matt Wazalowski uh, and Will Carver are two of my favorite authors since I've discovered them. Um, you know, I'm quite ashamed to admit that I, I only discovered them both last year. Um, Matt Wesolowski when I was sent Deity, and I love the way he experiments with fiction um, and the way he writes through that podcast medium and stuff like that. I think it's absolutely brilliant. I've just read um, Just Been Sent the Beresford by Will Carver and, just yeah. finished it and it's, it's just like, pff, it's just absolutely amazing. Um, I loved every minute of, a, of Will Carver's very disturbed mind. Um, but yeah, they're, they're brilliant. Um, so yeah, have you got a book, a two book deal with Verenda, or is that two is book? That... Yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah. But uh, so I've got to yeah. finish this one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so we'll go back to the questions um, from uh, the community, and this one is from Halo. So, what experimental structure would you like to try next? Oh, I don't know. Um, so this one, I've gone really boring, right? Because um, this my new guy, Robin. He's third person past tense. Um, I mean, it's. I think it's quite close third. But I am, like I say, I'm wondering about whether there are snippets of autobiography in there. Because I mm. think if you knew when you were going to die, you might place a bit more importance on your life or maybe the time that you have. And mm. what uh, it's again, it's like with Rachel, I was like, say, so you're a home alone on maternity leave. What would you do? Because I think I just really want it to be realistic. Mm. And so I'm thinking, like, you know when you're going to die, you're convinced you're a bit more special than other people because there's something special about the dates that he knows. Mm. Um, what would you do? And I wonder, does that lend itself to an autobiography? So I've got, <laughs> got really naughty. I've just got gaps between my chapters at the moment. <laughs> and, said, and it says things like, might be autobiography bit here. Um, mm. So it's all a bit it's, it's like bare bones at the moment. Um, yeah. I have this plan for I had all sorts of weird plans because there's lots of events throughout history that he finds this common link between and whether those were all in there so you know then you'd be going about hundreds of years and I, ha I haven't been that brave yet so I think I'll just like keep making headway and yeah, then well. and then just see maybe slot it in afterwards I feel like that's one thing I did learn from the MA that until you've got a first draft you haven't yeah. got a block of stone to carve um, mm. that was there again like until you've got that first draft it's all just here isn't it and you yeah. need to get the words down and then it feels a bit more manageable it's sort of you, you can start slotting stuff in and with the email structure with Rachel that's what that was what I did I sort of you know be like hang on there's nothing driving her here this needs to go in because that causes a nightmare when you've used time stamped emails because you have to move everything yeah. And then you need to make sure she's not doing a school pickup. There's a little girl in the book. You need to make sure she's not doing a school pickup on a Saturday, which happened at one point, you know, when I was checking through, I was like, oh, God. And then everything has to shift again. <laughs> but I think, yeah, so I'll get to, I'll get a chunk of third person down and then I might start mucking about a bit. Love it. Brilliant. Yeah. 
Um, so we're very, very close to the hour. Um, so where can people find your books? Halo says that's a great idea, by the way, which I 100% Thank agree. You. Where can they find your books? Oh, um, my promotional T-shirt now. Oh. The promotional okay. bit, with a bit where I'm really pushy about my book. So New Look have brought out this T-shirt. I'm not kidding myself. It's oh, is it actually? I, oh, right. Yeah, it's on the New Look website. Don't buy that. Don't buy that. Buy this. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. but yeah, I, I had to buy it. I both it. and wear it, it and say, so, right? It was said to yeah. me. It drove me mad for years. I turned it into mm. a book to get all my anger out, and now yeah. I've got it on a bloody t-shirt. Um, wow, I thought you made that as like part of. <laughs> no, no, no. It's from wow. um, it's from New Look. <laughs> I saw it on their website because <laughs> I check the hashtag on Twitter every so often to see if anyone's reviewed the book, and yeah. it come up because someone had been sent it by mistake when they'd ordered right. jeans. And I was like, oh. <laughs> Um, yes, this is my book, and it's with Arenda Books, and you can get it cheaper on their website at the moment. Um, there's a special offer on, because they've got a new website as an ebook. but you can also get it on all the other places you can get ebooks. And then the yeah. audio book comes out on the 1st of June, and the paperback comes out the 10th of June. I don't know where it will be. I mean, hopefully, it will be stocked in lots of bookshops. Yeah, Hopefully were you, were you involved question. at all in the audio selection and stuff like that? You know, with the voice. I got, given a, I got given a little choice, which I was amazed mm. at. Um, mm. And they went with my choice. Um, I loved all of them, but I felt like one of them sounded more like Rachel to me. And they mm. sent me a picture of her recording it the other day. She's called Nikki Dis. Mm. Um, so that was a really nice moment, just to be like, bloody hell. Um, mm. I feel a bit sorry for her having to read out all these emails. Um, <laughs> and I'm rubbish. You know, when you have to do like events where, yeah, it's a part of the MA, they make you do an event where you read out loud, which is quite good practice. I, I'm yeah. not very good at that. Uh, so, yeah. I mean, you I'm, would, I'm, I'm, I'm guessing you've not had to do that yet because obviously with COVID and stuff. Not you, really. No, no, I've got have you picked a, out a section that you know you're going to read if, if you. It's always if the beginning. Then I don't have to give it. If I do the beginning, I don't have to do any context. Um, right. like you know we've reached this bit I don't have to do any backstory so I've always done the beginning yeah. when I've done little events um, nice have you practiced maybe in front of family and stuff just to, so the to MA, we had an actress come in on the MA and work with each mm. of us um, which was amazing wow. um, mm. there was so much I didn't know I was doing wrong um, <laughs> and then all the Americans who were because we, we did it with the like those three MAs those crime writing fiction, uh, literary fiction and memoirs and the Americans on the memoir one they're just so natural they were amazing <laughs> yeah. like, How, what are they doing in American schools that they're all such good speakers yeah um, yeah so I had a bit of practice with her at just like you know you do you need to warm up it is a performance you're not just you know reading to yourself so I sort of take the approach by pretending I'm reading to my children <laughs> nice you just go a little bit dramatic but uh, i'm not like it yeah good luck to you when that eventually happens because i should imagine <laughs> it'll happen sooner rather than later yeah. um so yeah is it different from people watching in america and stuff can can they get hold of a copy if everything happens for a reason I now think, or is it different i have things? a feeling it's america it, so the ebook is out everywhere um right. but the book book i have a feeling it's out in october in america but i don't know that for sure actually um Right. I'm sure we'll get in touch with somebody from America very shortly and they can check that for us and verify it. Um, but we, what we'll do is we'll leave uh, links to your book when we put the show out um, so people have that nice convenient link and they can find it. That's really America. kind of you. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Um, I still can't believe it's even for sale. So, like, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, well, that's the end of our show. Unfortunately, uh, we've come to the hour mark, but it's been an absolute pleasure speaking to you, Katie. Um, and, you know, thank you so much. And I wish you the very best of luck with, obviously, everything happens for a reason and book two when it eventually comes. And we'd love to have <laughs> you back on the show uh, to chat about that as well. Uh, but for now, we're just, we just this is a bit where yeah. we wave and we just go, bye, everyone. And Thank you so goes, much. So. That was really fun. Thanks yeah, for all the Yeah, please questions. tune in on Thanks. Friday. And have a great week, guys. So I'll see you later. <laughs>